Hello and welcome to The Hearing, our music review show here on the channel. I'm John. And from Chicago's North Side, I am Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's album, which is from 2019, Don't Wait Till Tomorrow by Yannicka. Yannicka are a British pop rock band based in Brighton, UK, who took their name from the Japanese word for midnight. Um, although the actual Japanese word is pronounced a little differently. It's more like Yonaka. Um, it's their name. They get to decide how to pronounce it, you know, when it's in reference to the band. <laughs> okay. Um, formed in 2014, the band first garnered attention two years later with their initial singles, Ignorance and Drongo. This led them to being signed by Atlantic UK and releasing their breakout single, Would Wanna Be the next year. They proceeded to release three EPs, 2017's Heavy, 2018, and 2018's Teach Me to Fight and Creature, as well as one more single in 2018, FWTB, which stands for Fucking with the Boss. And then, uh, Don't Wait Till Tomorrow is Yannicka's debut album. It was released on May 31st, uh, just less than a week ago, as we were recording this last Friday. Yeah. Um, uh, by Asylum Records in the UK and Fueled by Ramen, a subsidiary of Elektra here in the US. It's all Warner Music Group. Um, produced and recorded by the band in their home studio, which amazes me for a major label debut. But, uh, well, and for the, the cleanness of the yeah. sound. Um, engineered by bassist Alex Crosby and features Teresa Jarvis on vocals, George Edwards on guitar, Alex Crosby on bass and keyboards, and Rob Mason on drums. I have never heard more English names. <laughs> and now on to the tracks. Reminder, I don't edit any songs into our episodes for copyright reasons, but down in the description and on our blog at johnandscotto.com, you'll find links to the album on Spotify and YouTube, so you can listen along if you'd like. On to track one, Bad Company. Not a cover of the Bad Company song. <laughs> Not even a Bad Company pastiche. Just, no, no. Yeah. It's actually about anxiety. Um, yeah. And they do something kind of interesting on a few songs. They begin with the the opening riffs are vocal instead of guitar. Yeah, which is an interesting change of pace. Um, this one particularly, I like it. it it's uh, happens in the beginning and after the choruses, which is you know nice change from a guitar riff. Um, and I just love the groove and the snare sound on this. Uh, Rob Mason, not a very technical, showy kind of player. Yeah, but solid as hell. Um. And I, I, really, even, I thought it was, uh, I was quite surprised at just how poppy it is, you know? Mm. <laughs> not, not that, you know, that it's shocking that their sound is pop. It's shocking that you were attached to this band with the pop leaning. Um, they started <laughs> off, I was actually going to get to this a little later song, but they started off much more rock, uh, much more conventional rock um, with those first few songs. Um, they've kind of been moving more in a pop, hip hop influenced direction of you know over the last couple of years, and they just kept me. Uh, admittedly, when a new song comes on, it comes out, it has to grow on me for a bit, but I yeah. still love their sound, uh, even though it has changed drastically. Like there's a there's for this track in particular, there's you know a very like Halsey vibe going mm -hmm. on here. I also hear a lot of yeah yeah yes. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, that's a comparison that they get a lot. Um, love the high end of Teresa's voice on the pre-chorus. And George does some really nice textural stuff um, where he just plays these high single note bits in contrast to the, the key, this kind of wall of sound keyboard part. Yeah. Um, he started off, and this I'm going to go guitar geek a little bit here. Um, when they were more conventional rock, he was playing a Gibson ES335. It's a semi hollow, much more full, deeper, warmer sound, takes up more space. Over the, Recently, he switched to a Gibson SG. Um, Best known for Angus Young and Tony Iommi. Yeah. Um, much more piercing, shrill, kind of, I won't say shrill, thin, piercing, aggressive sound. And I'm wondering if that was just because he found one and he fell in love with it, or if it was an intentional choice as the role of guitar in their music changed. Yeah, you know, I knew Angus used that. I wasn't aware Iommi it, used the I same Iommi played an SG as well, yeah. Hmm. And I'm wondering if George chose that because it does fit their music more, because the role of the guitar is much more piercing. No. Yeah, it, it's just to play. He's, he's moved, moved much further up the neck in a lot of cases, and it's just kind of you know melodic bits and stabs, which the SG is much better for than an than a day thirty five would have been. Um, this starts off very poppy, and then it really kind of unloads in the chorus. Yeah, and picks up, and that's where it really goes kind of rock. Um, loved the pedal tone bass in the second verse. It just kind of picks. It gets gets very insistent in the second verse and much thicker. Um, 
love the line. Uh, tell me what you want. Tell me what you want. Is this just fun for you? Because I know that it's not. I know, I know that is not because I am you. <laughs> you have anxiety. You understand that line. <laughs> um, love the overlap uh, between the in the vocals between the cor the chorus second chorus and the bridge. Um, she just finishes the second chorus and the, vo the, the bridge just comes right in. Um, another great line, and you talk to me with your violent talk, but I won't react because I'll look psycho. Um, and then the chorus just gets real quiet with this beautiful layered guitar. Yeah, her her lyrics from you know just the few times I listened, you know they they really go from the 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 sublime to the blunt, you know, very yeah, yeah. <laughs> back um, and forth. I, I I've said this about Tally Kalstrom, and I, she I wouldn't put it that. Teresa Jarvis quite on that same level, but she also doesn't fuck around. You know, she just, she's very clear and very plain at points. Um, again, yeah, this is, again, one of my favorites. Loved it from the beginning, from the first time I heard it. Um, it was the first single they put out for this album. Okay. Um, on to track two, Lose Our Heads. This is, again, where you get kind of, you know, blunt, because this is really about the importance of youthful indiscretion. <laughs> you know, it's a it's about how you know it's important to kind of be foolish at when you're young. It's strange because this one doesn't really feel like it's of our time. I mean, they're they're going for like an older sound in this. Uh, it could also <laughs> be because our time necessarily doesn't have a feel or a sound to Man, it. I, 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 like... we're, I think we're too old to really know <laughs> what the pop sound is today. But I, uh, you know, it's. It's mixed. That's the problem. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I'm pretty. I, I'm you more so than me to pop more than than I guess yeah. the average person. Mm -hmm. I mean, but <laughs> it's very very mixed. Uh -huh. um, but on this one, I love the insistent kick in the in the verses and the subtle bass line. Alex is kind of in the in that Cliff Williams school. Uh, from ACDC again, referencing ACDC. Odd that I've referenced ACDC twice with these guys because they're nothing alike. Right, I was going to say. <laughs> but, but Alex is in that same vein in that he doesn't play a note he doesn't have to. Because there's a, a well variety on this album. It's way mm -hmm. too eclectic for ACDC. Yeah, yeah. well, um, uh, instrument, George happens to play an SG now. And yeah. Alex is in that same school as Cliff Williams where he doesn't play a note that he doesn't have to play. He's very economical. And it works perfectly. Because he, him, and Rob Mason just put down these incredible grooves that are just individually very simple, much like Cliff Williams and Phil Rudd did. Um, Love the groove when the snare comes in, um, and the melody in the chorus is really nice. Uh, second verse, we get this kind of funk guitar, <laughs> which George does a couple of times here and there. Um, and the most dramatic line in this moment of the song, the, the height of the climax, the, the climax of the bridge, is the line, let's get wrecked. <laughs> Which sums up the song. You know, the chorus is, um, teach me how to, what is it? Um, teach me how to love, I'm asking you to break my heart in half. St drag me straight to hell so I can know that heaven exists as well. Let's lose our heads. It's, it's about living when you're young. Yeah. On to track three, Awake. This is one of their was one of their original singles. It was uh, or, you know initial singles. It was called Ignorance originally. Oh, um, very similar to the original arrangement, just padded, just added to. Um, yeah, love the sparse arrangement on this one, and the sound effects are all new. Um, they get kind of echoed percussion. Um, love the high guitar and then the keys between the verse the verses, um, and the groove on the choruses. It's, this one's very yeah yeah yes uh like they really were, were going for the same might be my favorite so far on the album mm -hmm. i mean the the first two i mean i don't think that there was anything i disliked about them they just you know i just didn't, didn't quite, get grabbed didn't quite right off my first two but this mm -hmm. one it was first like there there's more going on here than yeah. just a halsey you know kind of pop thing mm -hmm. and then they go rock for this third section of the song. Yeah. They just get aggressive uh, in the I'm awake section. And the change in title makes sense because the original title was ignorance and the core in the B section, because I don't know if it's one is necessarily the chorus over the other. Right. But it's, it's just the line, ignorance is not bliss to me. 
And then you get into the third section was I'm awake now, honey, I'm awake now. Um, and it's kind of, it changes it from kind of a, um, a more negative section of the song to a more positive section of the song, sort of the title change, which is an interesting yeah. choice. Um, <clears throat> I love the background vocals in the third verse. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the, and I think it was generally an improvement over the original, even though the original is a great song. Um, I love the screen vocals in the bridge. I do miss some one thing in the original though. In the in the bridge, there's that one screamed line, I stand untouched. Hmm. In the original, she yells it and George does kind of a death grunt. Okay. In this version, she just kind of screams it. Death grunts kind of went out in the mm. early 2000s. Well, but I mean, it's it's mixed with her scream. It just kind yeah. of fits nicely. It just beefed it up a little bit. In this version, you just have Teresa scream, which is great. But it's just, I, I, I kind of liked that little extra oomph in there on that line particularly, because that's the most aggressive part of the song. Um, on to track four, Guilty for Your Love. This one for me is the weakest. Um, it's just a bit too poppy for my tastes. Um, it is starting to grow on me, but this is really just a straightforward pop song. Really what caught my, uh, I mean, the, the breakdown like towards the end is really what caught my attention about this one. Cause like, yeah, early on it was kind of like, it was kind of going in one ear and out the other. And I was starting to want, my attention was wandering off and then the breakdown happens. And that's what I start turning back. Like, Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I do like the insistent pre-chorus where the drums really start coming in. Um, the electronic drums, there's a great mix of acoustic and electronic percussion on this one. And I think Rob played the electronic stuff in real time. Um, he just used pads because it doesn't sound programmed. I can usually pick a pro pick out a programmed line. Yeah. As a you know, I'm a bass player, so I'm, I'm accustomed to what what is a human drummer and what is a electronic drummer because <laughs> one is a much harder to keep up with. The, the band from El Mariachi. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I also like that it gets heavier in the second verse, and the slow, sparse bridge was a really nice change a surprise on to track five rock star this was a nice spot to slow things down at least in the beginning of the song yeah this um, one uh you know might be the most interesting yet on it um love the kick in the beginning and teresa on this one and this is something i've noticed for, for her after i heard this song i hear a lot of stevie nicks in her voice that was coming up for me. <laughs> it's really obvious on this one, but uh, since I noticed it on this, I've noticed it in other songs. Yeah. I think Stevie Nicks must have been a big influence on it. A her. few tracks later, like, yeah. am I picking up a Stevie Nicks? <laughs> I, I think Stevie Nicks must have been a big influence on her. She's definitely, definitely. got that warble. Um, love the harmonies on the chorus, and, and I love when it picks up after the first verse, because it starts really slow. And it's not even just the the lead vocal being Stevie Nicks. It's the background singers. Oh yeah, well she. Yeah. I think she did all the vocals. On I, I think so too. Um, but the 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 backing vocals were, were definite like Stevie Nicks sort mm -hmm. of. Because I know live Rob and I think to an extent George sing backup, but on the album I think it's all her. Yeah. Um, love how it picks up in the middle verse because it starts really slow, and it, the song is called Rockstar. You expect mm -hmm. something loud. So when you get this ballad, it's it's interesting. <laughs> and then it picks up nicely. Love the groove in verse two. And some just more te great textural playing. George has an admirable ability to constrain himself for a guitar player. He always just plays for the song. You know, he never really shows off. Um, there's only two spots where I can really kind of say he solos in on the album. And this is the fun thing about when a band is eclectic like this, because like what I was saying about track two being like, oh, this doesn't really sound like our time. It kind of sounds like a throwback thing. This sounds, you know, very fresh. This yeah, yeah. song, yeah. So it's just, you know, if you don't like the song, you can wait. <laughs> oh, yeah, true, <laughs> true. And you're gonna get something yeah. completely. If you different. don't like this song, wait till the next one. Um, right, because you're not stuck with an album right. full of the same repetitive. song over and over again. And the singles had me a little concerned um, about that because the singles were uh, "Bad Company," uh, "Creature," which was on a previous album. EP. I keep wanting to say "Till the Day I Die" after yeah. you say the name of that other single. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> fired up, the, and and so the the singles were kind of all similar. Um, 
So I was a little concerned that the album would be a little samey. I was very surprised at how diverse it was. Yeah. Um, this one's rapidly becoming one of my favorites. Love the frenetic bass in the bridge. Just as I start to think Alex is, you know, very reserved and only plays when he has to. He, the bridge comes in with this really frenetic, interesting bass part. Yeah. Um, on to track six, Creature. This first appears on the EP of the same name. Um, another great opening vocal riff. This is one that's very poppy, but has a rhythm that is very rock. This it's one brought me mix. off the fence. You uh, know, I was kind of like, ah, oh, you know, I'm not sure whether I'm into this. And this was the one where I'm like, yeah, you know, we've had a we've had a couple of good ones so far. And now there's this. So yeah, I'm. Uh, <laughs> th this one, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's like there's more to come here, back for here. Love the bass sound and just a nice subtle part. Um, guitar geek stuff again. Alex looks. I think he plays a, a P bass mostly now. Friend of Precision Bass. Um, right. I've seen him play with Rickenbackers here and there. Um, he just knows how to get the perfect sound out of the, out of the P bass, which I mean it's not difficult, but he just knows just. I, I just love his tone, and I think it's more, just as much of him as a bassist as it is as an engineer. Um, he just knows how to get just the right tone out of it. Um, love the uh, insistent kick in the first verse, and I end the Harley Quinn reference. Well, yeah, and it's not Harley Quinn; it's Harley, Harley Quinn, the Quinn, Joker's yeah. ex, because it's about how she's kind of admitting she's kind of insane, <laughs> or kind of you know has issues, and this is what you get if you're in a relationship with me. Um, love the crushing snare on the chorus. Um, again, drums mic'd set perfectly. Um, kudos to Alex on an engineering level because it sounds perfect. They did this in the home, huh? Yeah, this was in a home studio <laughs> in, engineered by the bass player. Um, love how the drums pick up in the second verse and uh, loved the line, I'm the rush of your life, a broken paradise. If you've ever been in a wildly unhealthy but tempting relationship, you get <laughs> that line. Yeah. Um, love the sound effects right before the bridge. There's just kind of this howl sound effect, you know, kind of roaring, howling sound. Um, great counterpoint on the guitar during the bridge. Um, another note about how George just plays to the song instead of showing off, which is admirable as you know, someone who plays guitar has been playing for 30 years. It takes a lot of self-control to just play to the song and not just crank it up and you know blast all over the place. But that's what live performances are for. <laughs> <laughs> True. I don't know if he takes any kind of extended solo live. You know, you you stick to the plan in in the studio, but then when you can do some crazy shit live, that that you know people but, might not expect the uh, direction. But going. just from a compositional standpoint as well, because I know I don't know if this is true now, but in the past, it was they, Teresa and George co-wrote everything. Yeah, um, I think they might still. Um, and if the guitar player is writing the songs, writing the music, basically. I, I'm. I, it's admirable that he's writing restrained music that doesn't just show off his playing all the time. You know, it actually gives everybody a chance to show off, and yeah, it's pre, they're just beautifully crafted songs. You know, this is pop at its best because pop is about craft. True, it's about crafting a good song, not just showing off or, or being you know being technical or obscure, self indulgent. And these are just great, you know, mostly just beautifully crafted songs. Um, on to track seven, Don't Wait Till Tomorrow. Uh, some great interplay between the vocal and the bass. It's another intro vocal riff, but the bass plays this great counterpoint to it. Um, love the doubles vocals in the verse. And that's something I didn't catch until, this was another one of the singles. I didn't catch until maybe the fifth time I heard the song. I mean, for me, this wasn't very memorable. It kind of surprising for a title track to yeah. be this kind of like, oh. <laughs> it's one that has grown on me the more I've heard it. Um, I didn't love it at first, but, you know, it, it's, it's there are a lot of subtleties to it. Um, doubled vocal, a little bit sparse arpeggio between the choruses. Um, and the vocal melody in the, in the second verse deviates a little bit, which I always love when you don't just repeat the melody. Um Love how the groove evolves and the kind of stripped down bridge. There's an acoustic on the bridge, bridge, which was a very nice surprise. I just wish the guitar was a little higher in the mix for the kind of solo 
Oh, after yeah. the bridge because he does these things where it's kind of sounds like he's going for a solo, but he just kind of plays one part and repeat. It's a riff. It's a high riff that they just spotlight for a minute. The weird been, Yankovic drum solo would have been nice if the guitar was a little higher in the mix at that point. And now for something completely different. <laughs> Track eight, punch bag. One of my favorites. This was in close contention for my favorite on the album. It's a good one. You, you, this is where I was like, I kept hearing Stevie Nicks here. They just get loud on this one. Finally. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, opens with distorted bass. If you've watched this show for any length of time, you know I am an absolute sucker for distorted bass. <laughs> Love the bass line in the, in the verse. Um, the vocals and the guitar mixed together for this really nice high riff. And there, there's just nice little stabs on the guitar in the second verse. Or yeah. During the verse, rather. And it's a hard rock, it's basically a hard rock song with some very light guitar work. It's all just vocals, bass, and drums. Right. The vocals and the music in this just crush. Yeah. The lyrics. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's just very straightforward and blunt. Yeah. You didn't try to pretty it up or get clever. Um, no stranger danger, though. If or if you um, do use it, you don't you repeat it. Fair point, fair point. Um, <laughs> love the spoken chorus. Or pre-chorus, she just yeah. practically raps the pre-chorus. Um, high descending with this nice high descending guitar part over it, and the drums pick up for the chorus beautifully. Amazing snare sound, and then we get these choral vocals right before the bridge. Yeah, it, 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 which is a, a, a surprising thing in a hard rock song. <laughs> um, and then again, another kind of guitar solo. Um, I, I'm kind of. You know, having played for over 30 years, I'm kind of over guitar solos, but it would be nice to hear one once in a while. <laughs> right. Um, they're, on, they're, they're good to when, when used with caution, but you still want one. <laughs> it'd be nice to have just George show off, particularly on, on uh, the, the hard rock song. Yeah. I think should, I, I appreciate that he keeps it in his pants for the rest of the album and plays very, you know, orchestrally. So I guess you could say, um, very, you know, um, compositionally. Um, but on the hard rock song, maybe let him show off a little bit. Yeah, just a little um, bit. It doesn't if, have to be you know, if he David wants Gilmore, maybe, you maybe know. Maybe he doesn't I mean. want to. Um, <laughs> on to track nine, Fired Up. This one first appeared on the EP, Teach Me to Fight. Um, love the merging of synth and bass on this one. Because the bass line is very subtle. And there's this kind of, um, I don't know how to describe it, kind of um, glitchy sounding synth sound on the bass hits. Yeah, which was a really nice touch. Just come merge the two of them. Um, loved the groove on the pre-chorus. Um, love the melody in the chorus. I mean, this is like hearing Stevie Nicks singing a Yeah 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 song, which this, is really this interesting. This again is very Stevie Nicks. You're right. <laughs> Especially that core, that verse melody is very Stevie Nicks. Oh yeah. Right. Um, and Teresa, not. I mean, she's good. Not a great technical singer. She's solid, but she's another one who's great. Like. Cammy uh, from uh, Darling Violetta at just conveying and and um, Jess from uh, Cavalry's at conveying the emotion of the song. You know, there's no question what the emotional intent of the song is. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some songs where they really do showcase her voice much better mm -hmm. than others. Uh, and I just also I love the synth and guitar riff over the bridge. Um, I think that was not so much on this song that I was commenting on her voice as so much as by this point in the album. Yeah. It had gotten to a point where I just, I love how she just doesn't fuck around emotionally. She just, you know exactly what the intention of the song is from her voice. Um, on to track 10, Wake Up. This is my favorite. Not an arcade fire cover. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. And I think it's about nightmares. Uh, this is when I realized she was British because um, <laughs> she used the word Fortnite. Uh -huh. <laughs> I just I love it. It has a very sort of late eighties, early nineties feel to it. Really interesting groove. Um, love the guitar riff and the verses again. Just this this kind of staccato, um, palm muted high part. Um, but very interesting. And this, I, I mean, it reminds me a bit of Company of Thieves, Genevieve, although I'm not sure how many people outside the area I live in. I've in heard the of them, I think mostly from your <laughs> Spotify plays. Know about them. 
maybe they maybe they've heard of who knows i mean mm. rest in peace company of thieves i don't think uh, i don't think they exist anymore or uh, maybe they do it's kind of weird <laughs> it's complicated i think is the status <laughs> of that uh-huh. but yeah the melody is really interesting in this one yeah a particularly pre-chorus um and i love how the groove just develops into the chorus there's no significant change there's a big change in timing it's just a subtle little build in the groove which i love um, I mean, they, they do have this Asian feel, at least to this one, mm-hmm. which I guess you could, you know. That's the guitar riff. Yeah. Um, and I love how most of the band just drops out for that second pre-chorus. It's just Teresa and a, and a synth. It is. It's it's a very dreamlike quality yeah. to it, which, of course, is what they're going for that you're waking up from, from the right, dream. Right, right, right. And the sparse last pre-chorus with just the vocal was great. Um, on to track 11, The Cure, not about the band The Cure. <laughs> it goes from Bad Company to The Cure. It's like this history of oh, wow. uh, music. I, just, I honestly just <laughs> caught that. <laughs> I don't know if that was intentional or not. <laughs> um, this one feels very 80s. This is like a very neo new wave sort of deal, like a very Duran Duran feel to it, actually. There was a period in the 80s um, when a lot of R&B acts were experimenting with distorted electric guitar. Yeah. That's what this reminds me of, that whole era. Well, I, all I was thinking was like Andy Taylor and his uh, some of his yeah. riffs from those uh, yeah. Duran Duran albums. And the melody, I, I hear more R&B than Simon Le bon on the melody, but I, I do get yeah. that. Yeah. Um, Love the combination of programmed and acoustic drums. I think they are programmed on this one, on the chorus. Um, Love the line, I'm the leader of the demons in my head today. (laughs) Um, Some more great funk guitar in the second verse. And a very brief kind of synth solo before the chorus is out. But that was, again, very, very 80s. So is uh, the guitar player the synth player in this? or No, it's uh, Alex, the bassist, plays keys. The bass is the key. Um, which is common. For, it, there's a thing where apparently bass player, if there's someone in the band who doubles on keys, it's usually the bass player. Yeah, it's very I odd. I, I mean, I guess because of like the synth bass, maybe, or the Probably, pedals. Probably, yeah. Um, I so don't they, know. I, I, it just seems to be a thing. Um, they to, tool around with yeah. it more than, than the other members. Who maybe. Knows? Um, Mike Levin from Triumph, Getty Lee, of course, from Rush. Um, so, JPJ. JPJ, yeah. Um, I saw um, a. You mentioned last week metric on Letterman. Yeah. And I watched. I, I looked it up on online on on YouTube. Um, and the bass player. First off, he was playing a, a, a regular scale bass in that clip. It is a short scale on the record. You sound different. But yeah. he was playing the keyboard, the bass player, instead of um, the singer. Anyway, back to Yannicka. Would you recommend it? Yes. I definitely recommend it. I've been a big fan of these guys since I first heard Would You Want Would Want to Be a couple summers ago. And their has sound has changed a lot. They have gotten much more pop, but I, I've gone with them the whole ride. Um, like I said, a lot of times when they release a new song, I I, I kind of feel like, okay, now they've gone a little too far. But they <laughs> but eventually I, I it grows on me and they hook me again. Lyrically, there's some points that I'm kind of like, e. But like musically and vocally, it's very solid. I, I was a huge Rush fan for many years, so I'm really picky about lyrics. Um, <laughs> I don't have, I don't really expect a lot from a lot of singers, from a lot of lyrics lyricists, typically, typically singers. Um, Teresa has some great moments, though. You know, um, that's it for "Don't Wait Till Tomorrow." Uh, just a quick note: um, we're going to be off a lot this summer, as we should. <laughs> um after next week we're taking a month off uh coming back in mid-july for a couple weeks taking the beginning of august off coming back in mid-august so basically after this five more episodes still september just want to give you a heads up about that as i said that's it for don't wait till tomorrow until next time and we'll be reviewing sad fat luck by chess Kate. And yes, I have it written phonetically in my notes because um, it's spelled c-e-s-c-h-i Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.